there's so many different ways of healing and therapy is just one of those ways. And what I noticed for me as I was transitioning from being a reporter to working as a therapist is that I myself was trying different things in addition to therapy. I was getting energy work in the form of Reiki. I was having acupuncture. I was using flower essences. I started using herbs. And I noticed that it wasn't one thing in particular that was helpful. It mm-hmm. was a combination of all of those things. This episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, therapynotes.com. Be sure and check them out and be sure and use the promo code Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, and you can try them out for two months for free. A little over 15 years ago, when I started my private practice, I had to learn a lot and most of it the hard way. And I don't think you need to do the same. Hi, I'm Gordon Brewer, a licensed psychotherapist, and welcome to the Practice of Therapy podcast, part of the Psychcraft Network of Podcasts. Join me in this journey of discovery as we have conversations with other leaders and professionals in both the mental and allied health fields. Join us as we explore both the business and clinical sides of running a private practice. This is Gordon Brewer, and this is episode number 327 of the Practice of Therapy podcast. Hope you're having a good week or weekend whenever you might be listening to this. I'm looking forward to you hearing from my guest on this particular episode, Maureen Clancy. And we had a really rich conversation just about um, using alternative treatment methods or alternative medicines, that sort of thing, in the context of the work we do as mental health providers. And as I was re-listening to uh, our episode before we put it out, um, you know, one of the things that occurred to me is is that, um, you know, with mental health and in dealing with people, we put a lot of emphasis on evidence-based practices And one of the things that I, you know, and just thinking about that and pondering it as I tend to do with things is, is that, um, you know, even if there is research about the efficacy of a particular practice and that sort of thing, it is still based on subjective responses. So in other words, you know, a study being done over a particular treatment modality And then we hear back from clients, oh, do you feel better? And so that's subjective in and of itself. And so it really got me to thinking about, um, particularly after my conversation with Maureen, about how we tend to think about things. And I think, uh, and we we talk a bit about this in this episode, just about um, feeling kind of, um, if you will, shunned or uh, really get ingrained with only using uh, evidence-based practices, but I think there is room um, to look at alternative ways of treating people and doing things that might sound unconventional, particularly for the clients that we serve or the patients we serve, particularly if they are reporting back to us that, okay, what we're doing is working for them, that they're feeling different, they're feeling better, uh, which is a subjective thing on their part. So anyway, I just wanted to put that thought out there to you. Um, Yeah, that would be a whole interesting interesting discussion to have sometime with colleagues about um, the fact that we we look for evidence-based practices, but to get the data on whether it was effective or not, we're dependent on the subjective um, responses of our clients. So that's one of those things where it just, as Arsenio Hall used to say back in the day, things that make you go, hmm. <laughs> so, and if you don't know what I'm talking about with Arsenio Hall, uh, go look him up. <laughs> anyway, I'm really digressing here. But anyway, 
Um, hope you're having a good week. And before we get to my conversation with Maureen, I'd love for you to check out a few things. One is if you are interested in working with me or doing some consulting with me, I'd love for you to contact me about that. And if you'll just go to practiceoftherapy.com and you can click on the link in there up in the menu that just says uh, start consulting. And I'd be glad that'd be a good way for us to start a conversation. And also, uh, as you've heard me mention in several other episodes, a project that I've been working on with a friend of mine is the Mental Health Wear TN.com website and um, doing some um, uh, mental health awareness clothing and swag and that sort of thing um, is a way of helping out my friend Ashley. And so I'd love for you to take check that out. You can just simply go to mentalhealthwearetn.com and see all the new things that she's creating. Um, there are t-shirts and sweatshirts and uh, there's even some jewelry in there and a lot of different swag items that are totally related to mental health and also to our profession. So be sure and check it out. And also, real quickly, before we get to my conversation with Maureen, I'd love for you to hear from one of the people in the Sightcraft Network, along with a word from our sponsor, Therapy Notes. Hi there. I'm super excited to welcome you back to the brand new season of Scaling Therapy Practice podcast. This is the show where we encourage you to take deliberate steps towards sustainable growth. I'm your host, James Marland. In season two, we're specifically focused on one main topic, marketing for mental health providers. Every week, we're going to share about different parts of marketing, giving you simple tips and tricks to grow your mental health business. Every episode from season two will have a download or a handout from the show. So sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss these valuable resources. Good news, I'm not going to be doing the show alone. I've got some awesome friends who are going to be joining me from the SciCraft Network. You're going to hear from Lisa Mustard, Steve Bisson, Don Gabriel, and other special guests. We've joined forces for this season to share helpful advice on things we've learned and even <laughs> the mistakes we've made so that you don't have to make them. As the weeks go by, listen to us cover lots of topics on marketing, such as social media, how to market your own therapist, how to speak in public, and even how to start your own podcast or even just guest on podcast shows. We really want to hear from our listeners. So send us your questions, your comments, your thoughts to james at coursecreationstudio.com. That's james at coursecreationstudio.com. Make sure you check out season one, which, which is out now in it has lots of tips on scaling your therapy practice. Just go to coursecreationstudio.com and click the podcast section. So join us every Monday. We're going to learn a lot about intentional and sustainable growth for your therapy practice. Ready to upgrade your practice from a rusty bicycle to a shiny new sports car? Buckle up, because Therapy Notes is here to turbocharge your journey. It's the comprehensive practice management system you've been craving. Equipped with everything you need to navigate patient records, schedule seamlessly, host remote sessions, craft detailed notes, and tackle insurance billing with ease. And guess what? It's your trusty sidekick, available whenever and wherever duty calls. Picture having more quality time with your clients, all thanks to this digital assistant that never clocks out. Here's the kicker. It's Gordon approved, so you can trust it's the real deal. Bid farewell to paperwork headaches and embrace a new era of efficiency and top-tier care. Ready to level up your private practice game? Swing by practiceoftherapy.com slash therapy notes and punch in promo code Gordon for two months on the house. Enjoy the show. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome again to the podcast, and I'm happy for you to get to know today Maureen Clancy. Welcome, Maureen. 
I'm so excited uh, to be here with you, Gordon. Y- y- yes, yes. And as I start with everyone, why don't you tell folks a little bit more about yourself and how you've landed where you've landed? Yeah. Like most of your listeners, I've had a lot of twists and turns myself. I started out as a journalist and quickly realized that that wasn't for me. I'd loved listening to people's stories and I didn't really want to report on them and have mm-hmm. such a distanced um, relationship with the people who are going through things. And so I got injured actually as a reporter with a repetitive strain injury, like a carpal tunnel syndrome. Mm. So I had to stop that and Mm. figure something else out. And I went to therapy for the first time during that period. And I loved it so much. I got really interested in it and it dawned on me that, wow, this is what I loved about reporting without having to have that distance with people. I could really be in there with them. Um, So I'm thrilled that that's what I do now. And these days I have a private practice that I've had since 2008. I have a small group practice and we work with women, queer, non-binary, lesbian individuals who have experienced childhood trauma Mm-hmm. We're also currently going through enormous life changes, which always brings up either another layer of what happened, um, or if it was never even examined, it just brings all of that chaos into the present as you try to go through that change. So I really mm-hmm. love working in that specific place with clients. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's great. It's a much needed, much needed niche. And yeah. That's great. So, yeah. well, I know one of the things that we were chatting about before we started recording and, and it's something that you're passionate about is using kind of using alternative healing methods within therapy. And so for folks that might, might, might not be familiar with that or maybe need a little refresher on that, tell, tell us kind of what that's about and how you're using that in your practice. Yeah. I think there's so many different ways of healing and therapy is just one of those ways. And what I noticed for me as I was transitioning from being a reporter to working as a therapist is that I myself was trying different things in addition to therapy. I was getting energy work in the form of Reiki. I was having acupuncture. I was using flower essences. I started using herbs. And I noticed that it wasn't one thing in particular that was helpful. It mm-hmm. was a combination of all of those things. And mm-hmm. once I got to grad school, I noticed that pretty quickly there were some guardrails that were put in place right away. Like, mm-hmm. this is your scope of practice. This is it. This is what you are showing up for with your clients. And I always felt like that is so confining because for me, what was most helpful was more folded in rather than just therapy. So that's what first got me interested in bringing alternative healing into work is just my own personal experience with it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I think one of the things that, at least since I've been doing this podcast, I'm hearing more and more people really kind of voice the need for doing things just beyond kind of the traditional clinical practice in that you know, for example, people incorporating yoga with therapy. And, you know, the other other thing that comes to mind that might fall into the category of alternative healing are the use of psychedelics and, and that sort of thing. And the, the other thing, too, that's, I, and maybe, maybe I'm mislabeling it, but even EMDR is kind of a non-conventional way of, of doing, doing healing. And so, yeah, so you want to say more about that? Sure. I I really find it fascinating that the use of psychedelics in particular is becoming so much more common and researched and it's being sought after. Like I have people on consultations with me wanting to know about that. And I have some experience with that, but certainly not enough to feel like I can bring that in. But I think we're at a time when the mental health system is really at a crossroads. 
it's not serving us in a way that really helps. It can help for some people, but not for others. And there's all kinds of reasons for that, you know, access and and things of that nature. But we're at a time when we need to really think about what else can be helpful here. What mm-hmm. else can we use? And EMDR is a great example of that. I got trained in that in 2006, mm-hmm. um, pretty early on. And I remember going, this is kind of crazy. But as I do these practices with my fellow students, it's really working in me. I can see that it's effective. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, when I brought it into clinical work, I would say to clients, Hey, I just learned this thing and this is what it's supposed to do. This is what could possibly go wrong or what might not feel good. And this is what I'm going to do in case that happens. Mm-hmm. Would you like to try it? Mm-hmm. And so clients quickly tried it. All of them were like, this is amazing. I love it. How did you do that? It feels like magic. Uh huh. And uh-huh. so now that there are so many more people practicing EMDR, it's more commonplace. But way back in the beginning, and I certainly wasn't in the way beginning, um, it was really an alternative method for healing. Mm-hmm. And so that trajectory, I think, is going to be what we see more and more of alternative practices uh, right. and healing that can be brought into clinical work. Yeah. Well, I think uh, us seeing the science that kind of backs up the whole somatic effect when it, particularly with trauma and you know the you know the activation of the amygdala and all of those kinds of things finding ways that can calm that and you know to, you know I think there's any number of ways that that can happen I think and not, there's no one size that fits all. Great. And that's why I'm so excited to be a therapist right now, because Mm -hmm. we're really getting to understand that so much, especially with the limits of talk therapy for trauma, because with talk therapy, you know, the idea is that you gain insight and with the insight, you can believe something differently about yourself, but you still have body memories that really insight can't help with. Mm -hmm. And so that's where all the somatic work in in trauma right now is really helpful for clients because it does get at that survival response and those body memories and help to reconsolidate them. So Mm -hmm. it's not showing up like that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, give us some examples of how you're using alternative healing methods and medicine in, in your practice. And besides EMDR, obviously that's one that's pretty well known, but what are some other ways that you're incorporating that and how you incorporate it? So one of the things that I've been using most is Reiki. Mm -hmm. And that is an energy work that works subtly on the energy body. And I notice with anyone who's experienced trauma, there's something about experiencing trauma that can cause a sense of hypervigilance you're constantly on the lookout for danger and assessing danger in your environment so you can keep yourself safe. And Reiki in particular can really work well with that by calming down that nervous system response of constantly having to watch and be on guard for what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm doing Reiki with a client and I do distance Reiki, it's not hands-on Reiki, I can really feel that hypervigilance in their energy field and try to transmit that Reiki into, you know, where I'm experiencing it so that it dials down. Mm -hmm. And so that's been really effective with clients based on the report that I'm getting from them. Mm -hmm. So after a distance Reiki session, they'll say, I just feel like myself without all of that wondering and worrying about what's going to happen next Mm -hmm. or they'll say because i feel just more grounded i feel more in my body and solid um and there's not a lot of science to back that up it's really based on what i've experienced myself what others have experienced with reiki and what i'm hearing from my own clients Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's one thing that i'm incorporating with clients that's been really helpful good Good. Yeah. So how do you, are are you finding that people are coming to you specifically for that or are they, are you needing to introduce it during the session? 
sessions or uh, other. <laughs> it's so interesting that you ask that because there's a lot of fear involved in bringing in alternative healing for mm-hmm. me. And I think for other therapists too, who I supervise. And it's the idea of, well, this isn't evidence-based and am I going to lose my license? Right. Or right. how do I bring this into work with clients and have them understand the benefits and the risks? Mm-hmm. And so really, you know, first, what I'll, let me back up a little bit. Mm. That fear was really present in me for a long time. And I was so worried about that. And I've done a lot of work with that fear, like, where's it from? Who benefits from that fear? Is it something that is, you know, present? Do, is it a real thing for work with clients? Mm -hmm. What can I do to dial down that fear? And so little by little, I started saying, Hey, I offer this other healing modality, much like I used to say when I first learned EMDR, here's what it is. This is what I think it's going to help with. These are the potential risks. Mm -hmm. Would you like to try it? Yeah. And so you just heard me go through that verbal informed consent piece. Right. Right. And it's true of any intervention that you want to use in therapy. You have to know why you're going to use it, informing your clients what the risks and benefits are, and then seeing if they're open to it. If they are, do it. And if they're not, don't. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's how I started incorporating it with clients. And then I started getting calls for therapy where the more I was like out of the closet with it, the more I would hear, I really want to do that work with therapy. And I'm excited that you're offering that. I don't know anyone else who's doing that. So I started getting specific re- requests for that service. Mm -hmm. Not just therapy, but also Reiki with that. Um, And I would hear often from clients that they would say, well, I saw a therapist and then I also saw a Reiki practitioner. Mm -hmm. And bringing it under one roof just made it more convenient and easy for them. Uh So that's how I started doing it and how it exists today. Yes. What was the training process for learning the methods like for you? So I do other alternative healing, but for Reiki, since we're talking about that, There are three trainings that you go through. There can also be a fourth, depending on what school of Reiki is teaching it. So there's a level one where you do hands-on Reiki and you learn the basics. Level two, you learn distance Reiki. Level three, you learn even more of the basics and practice. And then level four, you can teach it to other Mm -hmm. people, which is really just attuning them to the ability to channel that energy um, and then teaching them how to transmit it to others. Yes. Yes. So, yes. So you mentioned uh, that you have some other methods or alternative things that you do. You want to say some things about those? So tarot, there's no particular school. You can do self-study. What was most helpful for me because I got so interested in it from my high school French teacher I would seek out teachers whose work I really respected. And for a while, there was a tarot reader studio. It was a conference that would happen once a year. It hasn't happened in a couple of years now, and I'm not sure if it's going to continue, but Mm -hmm. I would learn from others. But it's really about um, tapping into your own intuition and whatever impressions you get as you turn over those cards. Mm -hmm. And like most people who are on the front lines of helping people here, There's other abilities that we bring into that work. Uh, You could call them empathic abilities. Um, But tarot is another way of channeling that information. So how I use it with clients is I'll say, oh, you've got a question about should you do this or should you do that? Should we consult the cards? Do you want to see what the tarot says? And Mm -hmm. some of them are like, no, I don't really, I'm not comfortable doing that. And that's fine. You know, this is about the informed consent piece. And the other clients are like, yeah, let's try it. And Mm -hmm. what happens is really meaningful for them if they do want to try it. Mm -hmm. They report that it's it's non-clinical information that brings another layer of understanding and healing into the work. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a, I, I would guess that part of part of why that probably works, and this is just speculation on my part, is that it brings an element of meaning to what they experience, and that there's a, kind of a, I, I'm going to dare say, a mystical kind of spiritual component to it that people it seems to speak to people. I really appreciate that you brought in that meaning piece mm -hmm. because one of the best things about therapy is that it helps you make meaning of your experience mm -hmm. and what's happening, but it's not just therapy that'll help with that. That might be the most common way to do it, yeah. but there are yeah. other ways too, and ways that have been in use for thousands of years in other places on the planet. Right, right. Yeah, I'm always reminded of when I think of meaning, I'm always reminded of Viktor Frankl's um, book, Man's Search for Meaning. And and I, I paraphrase this quote. I'm not sure exactly if it came from the book or just a quote of his, but he said essentially that if we don't have meaning in our life, we will quickly substitute finding meaning with finding pleasure. And pleasure is usually short term and not very not very doesn't have much substance to it whereas if we find meaning in our life and purpose in our life that is really what gives us more of the oomph or the or the 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 path for really more wholeness so yeah yeah i love that cuz that's so present in trauma work Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there's often this sense of why did this happen to me? Mm -hmm. And really, you know, a definition of trauma can be, it overwhelms your ability to cope and understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, bringing, you know, bringing yourself to therapy and trying to find meaning is really helpful in healing trauma as is finding meaning with all of these alternative Mm -hmm. healing modalities that right. we now can use. Right, right. Well, I think it helps people rewrite the rewrite the narrative they have about themselves. And 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 that's where, where change occurs because they can't necessarily change what has happened to them, but they can certainly change what that means to them. And so that I think is where healing yeah. occurs as well. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And really about that belief of who they are because that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love seeing that change. Yeah. Yeah. Realizing that they're not damaged goods, so to speak, but they're whole, whole people that are worthy of all the good things in life. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that wholeness is really, you know, why I bring the alternative healing in, because it's not just therapy mm -hmm. that is going to be helpful. It'll be all kinds of other things. I, I once had a client um, who lost her brother, and she said, it's okay to share this, but we did therapy for a while. She started seeing me for something else, and her um, brother was killed in a traffic accident. And she found one of the most healing things was to ski up and mm -hmm. down a mountain over and over and over again because mm -hmm. she used to do that with him but she found the action of skiing to be so healing and it added such a depth to her healing mm -hmm. that wasn't happening in therapy and it really was another one of those instances where I was like wow there's so many ways to heal there's so many yeah. things that you can do it's not just clinical work oh, right right oh well, I love this stuff. And Maureen, I've got to be respectful of your time. And, and and I've really enjoyed this conversation. Tell folks how they can get in touch with you if they want to find out more about what you're doing and your work. I love supporting therapists uh, who want to get better at clinical work, but are also interested in how to incorporate that healing that they find helpful in themselves and that they're curious about. I can be found on my website, maureen-clancy.com. You can often find me on TikTok. I love making quick videos about healing from trauma and alternative healing tools. And I'm also on Instagram and LinkedIn. I feel like I'm on all the things. Mm -hmm. That's where you can find me. And I love connecting with people out there on that. 
So, well, Maureen, you have any parting thoughts as we kind of end this? Yeah. If you're interested in bringing something into your clinical work, think about why. What's mm -hmm. that intervention going to do? And then do the informed consent piece and try it. Mm -hmm. See what you notice. Yeah. I think there are a lot of different paths to helping people heal. And I don't, like we said earlier, no one size fits all. Thank you for being on the podcast. And I hopefully we'll have another conversation before too long. Well, big thanks to Maureen for being on the podcast, and I'm glad she reached out to me about being on the podcast because I think, um, you know, as we as we live and learn and, you know, things constantly change, I think being able to think about what we do in different ways um, is important for things uh, thing for us to look at. Um, certainly using alternative approaches is not necessarily for everyone. But I think there are a good uh, good number of people out there that are looking for that and that, you know, and if your own clinical experience, you find some, some validity in doing things in a different way, I would say absolutely go for it. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, my whole train of thought after listening to this episode is, is that, um, again, that whole notion of of uh, evidence-based practices really are based on the, the subjective reporting of clients' experience of a particular modality as far as if they are getting better or if things are changing based on what is done with them in a session. So I think it's, uh, I think it's food for thought, and I think that, um, yeah, it's worth looking into. And also, um, be sure and check out Maureen's things. You'll find links here in the show notes and the show summary. And um, yeah, so be sure and check it out. And also, a big thanks to our sponsor of the podcast, Therapy Notes. Uh, they are the leading electronic health record system for mental health providers. And as you've heard me say, it's who I use in my practice and I've always been impressed with their support and all of the new things that they continually add and things that they improve. Um, I, I will say that, um, yeah, it's, it's just a great system, and that's why I can get behind them and say, check them out. So be sure and check them out, practiceoftherapy.com slash therapy notes, and be sure and use the promo code GORDON, just G-O-R-D-O-N, and you can try them out for two months for free. And also, take some time to go over and look at uh, my friend Ashley's website, mentalhealthwaretn.com, and see if there's some things that might interest to you. And if you uh, also, she does custom work as well. So if you see something that you like and you want it tweaked in some way or names added to it or a practice name added to it, um, let us know and she can take care of that for you. So take care, folks, and we'll be back with you again for another episode of the Practice of Therapy podcast. And oh, be sure and take time to follow us and, and or subscribe to the podcast wherever you might be getting your podcasts from. been listening to the Practice of Therapy podcast with Gordon Brewer, part of the Psychcraft Network of Podcasts. You can find out more about the other great podcasts in the network by visiting psychcraftnetwork.com. And if you haven't done so already, please visit us at practiceoftherapy.com and get your free private practice startup guide, along with a lot of other great resources and webinars and free things just by visiting. Also, be sure to follow us wherever you might be listening to your podcasts. This podcast is intended to be educational in purpose and is not intended to give legal, accounting, or counseling advice. If you need a professional, find the right person for that.